Well, the screen over there says you're live. So let's, uh, let's work on the assumption that I live. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good night, good Saturday. Could it be Thursday for anybody watching? I don't think so. But wherever you are, hello and welcome to another Friday night live stream with, uh, with yours truly. Let me know in the chat panel who you are and where you're viewing from this evening. Chat panel should be, if you're watching this on a desktop, it'll be up in the top right hand corner. If you're looking on a mobile, it's probably going to be below this video feed. But do let me know in the chat where you're joining from this evening. Always interesting to see where people are joining from. We've had a couple of local birds recently. We've had a couple from east and west of where I am, some from Toronto some from the US, some from mainland Europe. Interesting to see where we're all from. So let me know in that chat panel. Hey, hi Andy, thanks for joining again. And hi Sam, how are you doing? Hope you're keeping well. Hope Maisie's okay and your mum and dad. Thanks for joining as well. Thanks Andrew for joining as well from South Wales. Some, some news on the horizon Andrew from a, from a Welsh perspective insofar that I am a, I'm another week closer to relocating to North Wales, which is why there's a pile of boxes growing in the corner of my office over there. So we will become neighbours in the very broadest sense um, in the coming weeks and months, just as soon as you guys can get lockdown lifted. Let's start cracking on with tonight's session then. Anybody else that joins in, feel free to... Last... West Isla one, West, West, West Yellow one, West, West Yellow. I'm going to call you West Yellow one. Apologies if it's not that you're joining from the concrete jungle of Coventry, the, the Midlands, I guess, the area there. So, what's tonight's session all about? Well, tonight's session is about uh, magnetic compasses. I want to sort of give you an insight into magnetic compasses, quite a high level insight. But I want to do more than just sort of say you twist this and point it and all this. You, you can get that in other places. And to be honest, I'm not sure trying to do it through a live stream is the best medium. So instead, I kind of want to do something a bit different and talk about aspects of a magnetic compass that don't get talked about very often, if, if at all. And they are important aspects. So I don't want to kind of shirk my responsibility and say I'm not going to talk about how to use them because I kind of am, but I want to go into areas that don't often get talked about, because you can find the other stuff elsewhere. I want to add some extra value. Before we do that though, before we look at the compasses, let me take 60 seconds to really quickly recap on the past two weeks of live streams, last Friday night and the Friday night before. The original live stream two weeks ago, I told you to get yourself a relatively small scale map, Ordnance Survey Maps if you're in the UK, and to just get out into your local neighbourhood, into your local estate, into sort of the local village or town that you're in, and just walk around areas that you're already familiar with. Take the map with you, and as you're walking around, slow down and relate the ground to the map and the map to the ground. And just keep doing that over a period of time to, to build up an understanding about what things look like on the map compared to what they look like in the real world and what things in the real world, how they're represented on the map. Last week, I, same map again, I showed you how to pimp that map and to be able to make it even more valu valuable to you when you are out by highlighting certain things on the map, the Eastings and Northings, by bringing those Eastings and Northings using a pencil closer to the area that you're working in if they're not pre-printed in that area and also working out your grid magnetic angle. So basically you've got this brand new map, you're quite comfortable with taking it out around your local area. I wanted to take you on a stage further about how to get the most value from that map. So that's what we've covered in the past two weeks. Let's have a look. Jim Bob's missed the beginning. Well, you, you've not missed, you've not missed the, the crux of it yet, Jim. I was waiting for you to join before I introduced this week's beverage. This week's beverage is Old Rosie. We all know an Old Rosie, right? Slowly matured and left on... Jesus, it's 6.8%. Crikey. And I'm not a big drinker, so I imagine I'm going to be offering some of you out for a fight in the car park by the time I've finished this very small bottle of Old Rosie. So that's tonight's beverage. 
What are you guys supping this evening? Let me know in the chat panel. Sam, you better not be drinking anything other than squash or pop, because I know how old you are. So drop your, uh, I'm gonna have focus. Let's see if we can do something about that. Either we've gone out of focus or I've very quickly developed cataracts. I'm not sure which it is, but I've gone very, very blurry. Not to worry. Let me know in the chat panel what you're drinking this evening. What drink have you brought to a... Oh, Andy's going for the... Andy's going for the carling. <laughs> what, what are we all going for? Anybody on the anybody on the posh stuff? Anybody enjoying a rosé or a, or, a, or a deep red? Or are we, are we on the wife beaters and the carling and the, the old roses this evening? Let me know in the chat panel. So that's what we covered in the past two weeks. Moving forward to tonight then, let's not hold you in suspense any longer, the magnetic compass. I'm hoping this isn't coming out too blurred. It's blurred for me. Oh, there we go, we're in focus again. The magnetic compass. Now, as I said right at the outset of this, Jim, you, must, you, missed, you might have missed this. The purpose of this live stream isn't to show you and talk about the minutiae of using these things. It's not a tutorial as such on using them. As I said at the outset, it's a difficult thing to teach remotely through a live stream, in my opinion. I also think there's loads of other places you can go to get that online. What I want to do is I want to talk about some aspects of this that don't get talked about very often, that are important, that will affect the way that you use this once you, you know, once you've learned how to use it or you get out on the ground again after this live stream, that don't often get talked about. And that's what I want to bring to bear today. I am going to be talking about this type of compass, which is br roughly regarded as a, as a base, a simple base plate compass. An extension of that is this kind of compass, which is a, which is a folding lid and a mirror and a sighting mirror on it. Essentially, they fall into kind of the same category. What I've also got that we're not really going to talk about is a very, very small brass button compass there. This was, um, this was procured from an MOD survival kit, from an air crew's, um, from an air crewman's vest. So there's good quality brass button compass there. And at the other end of the scale, we have the prismatic compasses that very, very large, bulky pieces of metal. They, they weigh a lot. Um, you don't want to get over the head by, hit over the head by one. And they kind of fit on top of your thumb and you look through them and they're sighting incredibly accurate. I don't have one. I'm gutted. I'd love to have one. Don't have one. But, um, we're not going to be looking at those this evening. The overarching principles of a lot of what I'm talking about today, though, is kind of irre it kind of it transcends any type of compass. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about, it kind of doesn't matter really what compass you've got. What I'm going to talk about, by and large, is a few exceptions, transcends regardless of your but of your compass type. Let me know in the chat. Oh crikey, Paul Castle's on the old rum and coat there. Oh, here we go. Waste Ilo one's warning me off about the old rosy. Never tried it before. I, I saw it on the supermarket shelf a week ago. I thought, I'll have that for next Friday. Yeah, I do like a mixed fruit copper bag, I will admit, but um, I, I went for this, but I've got I've got Waste Ilo one warning me off. So let me know in the chat. If I start to go downhill, if I start to deteriorate, even more, even more so than normally on an eight o'clock on a Friday night after a busy week, let me know in the chat panel. Hit the, hit the warning bell. Also, let me know in the chat panel, what type of compass have you got? Are you trying to do all of your navigation on a button compass? Are you using a more standard type base plate compass, whether it's like that or it's got the, the folding hinged sighting mirror on it? Or are you, God bless you if you are, doing all of your navigation using a good old bulky prismatic compass? Let me know in the chat panel. It would be good to get a sense of, of what you folks are using so I can kind of pay more attention to that. So let's see what comes in on the chat. Bottoms up. Ooh, a nice start with old Rosie there. Where are we gonna to start today then, whilst I'm waiting for those answers to come in? A magnetic compass. It has a red needle within it. I'm going to hold this at a slight angle. And you may see that red needle kind of moving, juggling around, rotating. The, the, the common perception of where that red needle is pointing is magnetic north. That's the kind of the, the common 
perception of where it points is magnetic north. It's a magnetic compass. It's attracted to something. What is it attracted to? It's attracted to magnetic north. I want to unpack that a little bit because there's an interesting little bit. Of, it's there's something useful to know here if ever you are buying a compass or you are traveling and planning to use a compass when you get there. Jim Bob's is a, a base plate and lens attic, a K and R Alpine. I don't know what that is, a K and R Alpine, Andrew. I'm not sure. Expand if you wouldn't mind in the chat, pal. K and R Alpine. I don't know. Paul's using a standard base plate. Yeah, I, I've most of my work has been done over the years using a base plate. The common conception is it points to magnetic north. And if you were to say that out loud, nobody would laugh at you. Me neither. It, it's broadly right. But equally, it's not quite right as well. And it's, the, it's, it's important to know why it's not quite right in case you are ever traveling anywhere with your compass. There we go. There's my son's globe there. Crikey, the... the Terrible, terrible focusing tonight. Apologies for this. At least it appears to be here. I don't know if it is for you. There's the earth there. Magnetic north is roughly, roughly at the top of the earth there. I don't want to get into arguments about exactly where it is. It moves. It's not always in the same place. It's static. It, it, it's constantly moving. It's not a static position. It is roughly at the top. Though. Let's, let's keep it simple. What you can't see on the ground or on a globe or on anything unless you Google it and look for it is all over the Earth's surface there are geomagnetic fields. There's a mouthful for Friday night. I'm glad I haven't sucked more of that. Geomagnetic fields. They're all over the Earth's surface. They move over time, but they all run in that direction of magnetic north. They don't run in a straight line to it though. It's not like a bullet. It's not like, you know, it's not like a bearing. It doesn't go in a straight line. It kind of wanders over the Earth's surface and gradually bends and bobs and weaves itself to the North, uh, not the North Pole, the uh, magnetic North. There are several of these geomagnetic fields on the Earth's surface. Depending on where you are in the world with your compass, you may be on a different geomagnetic field than me or somebody else on this live chat or where you were yesterday or where you were a week ago as you move around the earth's surface you are going to land in probably possibly a different geomagnetic field and it's that geomagnetic field that that red compass needle is actually aligning to so yes it is pointing to magnetic north in the simplest of terms you wouldn't lose a pub quiz for it. If you wanted extra points in the pub quiz though, if you wanted to be really nerdy, then you could suggest that it's actually the geomagnetic lines of the Earth's surface in the area of the Earth that you are in, that it's actually aligning to. Now I'm gonna get onto why the hell I'm telling you this in just a second, but I wanna have a look at the, the chat bar here. Jim's saying focus is better when you are close. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm not sure why on earth it's, it's going out tonight. It was fine last uh, last week with my new webcam. Why am I telling you? In fact, before I go on, let me know in the chat panel, were you familiar with this notion that your compass doesn't strictly point directly to magnetic north, but is aligning with the magnetic fields on the Earth's surface that lead to magnetic north? Were you aware were you unaware? Let me know in the chat panel if you wouldn't mind. It's good to get a sense about where where people's uh, levels of, of, of theoretical knowledge is before we go any further. Were you aware of that? Were you unaware of that? Crikey, Dave, do you mind me asking where you're joining from? Apart from just south of the equator. There's a, there's a lot of it, right? Um, where, where, where are you from? And how would it affect, how would being on the equator affect my compass? I'm, look, I'm, I'm not laughing at you, I'm laughing at some of the other comments that have come in subsequently. Um, it, would, it would affect it in the, in the most immediate term for exactly the reason I've just said. Depending where you are on the equator, you may be in a, you, you will be in, a different magnetic 
field than somebody, let's say, on the other side of the earth that's on or around the same lines of latitude that you're on. So that's how it would affect it because it's depending on where you are on the Earth's surface, depends on what magnetic geomagnetic field you are you are in, and therefore it affects your compass. Now it's perfectly possible to move some quite considerable distances and still be on the same magnetic field. These, these are not things like postcodes, these are not things like grid squares or anything like that that are quite small. They're, they're bloody great pieces of area that cover the Earth. Um, so it's perfectly possible to travel hours potentially and still be in the same geomagnetic field that you're in hours previously. So don't think it's a case of crikey, this is this is really worrying. It needn't be, it needn't be. Ah, Batuk. <laughs> Dave, you're knocking around in Kenya. Is it, what's it called? Oh, not Meg, man, that was Canada. Crikey. Um, fill in the gaps for you. You know what I'm trying to get to. Yes, it would, Dave. Yes, it would. It would still vaguely point, it would point towards Magnetic North. You're absolutely right. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up, the reason I'm not just ignoring this fact about, I need to come closer, Jim said, if it's going out of focus, I'm closer. Um, the, reason you, the reason it's important to be aware of this is, Depending on where you are on the Earth's surface, your, your compass is pointing along this geomagnetic field. Let me, let me give you a really simple illustration. Imagine my finger is the needle that the magnetic compass, the magnetic needle, rests upon. It's a pivot point. And my, you know, my fingers are, are, are magnetic north on the needle. And it, it swivels around on that pivot point there. The compass is very easily affected by things. If you were using a compass that has been balanced for one part of the world, if you were to use it in a different part of the world slash different geomagnetic area, that carefully balanced pin needle is going to do that, or it's going to do that. It's going to be off balance. It's going to be off kilter. If it's off balance and off kilter, it's not going to be able to rotate as easily as it can because it's not floating nicely in that fluid it would actually be catching on the top or bottom of that compass bezel the needle would be dragging either the top of it or the bottom of it could be dragging as it pivots round that's going to affect the accuracy of the compass that's going to affect everything that you use that compass to do therefore if you are traveling to different parts of the world, do one of two things. Either buy yourself a compass in advance that is globally balanced. In other words, just take it wherever you want. Be fine. Be fine. Just take it wherever you want. It's globally balanced. If I look at this compass... Yes, now I'm going to try and hold this up to camera. If this focuses, I'll be gobsmacked. But I'm going to hold this up to camera. No, there's, there's no way you're going to see it. On the back of this compass, which is a military compass, a military issue compass, on the back, in possibly the smallest print possible, there is the initials MN, Mike November, for Magnetic North. It indicates what, what, um, that's what I'm looking for, geomagnetic field this is balanced for it's balanced for the magnetic north one go to other areas of the world and you may need to look for a compass that has different initials on the back indicating that it's balanced for that part of the world now i've been all over the world with that compass i've used it in all areas of the world and it's always performed admirably it could have been because the areas of the world that i went to all fell under the same geomagnetic plane. Remember, this isn't something like a postcode or a country. It doesn't stick to borders or anything like that. You could travel huge distances and, and not need another compass. The upshot of this is, if you are going somewhere different in the world, it's worth checking whether the compass you have is balanced and will perform accurately for the part of the world that you are going to. In a nutshell. Let's have a look at people's thoughts on this. Tony from Dublin is aware of the geomagnetic fields. Nice one. Nice one, Tony. Good effort. Ah, Dave. Dave's coming up with an interesting thing about remember to be three metres away from his weapon when using a compass. We're going to come on to that, Dave. Keep that. 
keep that tucked away up here. We're going to come on to that in just a second. Sam is saying, if I am a really attractive person, will that affect magnetic declination? Absolutely. Like most things, you know, if you're, if you're a magnet, then things are going to be attracted towards you. Um, clearly being, being attractive to the opposite sex or even the same sex, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm non-judgmental, it's going to affect your compass. So if you are incredibly attractive, you might need a different types of compasses. Um, clearly, I've managed to get away for decades with using this one, which suggests to me that I might not be that attractive. But it's a good point and, and well raised, something you definitely need to consider, Simon. So we've talked about this, this concept of, of compasses kind of do point to magnetic north, yes, but actually it's important to know that that's not quite what they're doing and why they're not quite doing it, but more importantly, rather than just the theory, it affects the accuracy of your compass. So make sure you've got a good compass for that neck of the woods, that area of the world. I'm just gonna have a little look and see what else we were gonna cover under this sort of section. No, okay, that's good. So let's go, let's go to Dave's point here. I've mentioned a couple of times that a compass is a sensitive instrument, a bit, a, bit, a little bit like myself. It's easily affected, it's very, very sensitive. It's easily affected by things. I would break those three things down into man-made and natural. Come up with, if you wouldn't mind, drop into the chat panel. Dave, you've already got a head start, so you're gonna to have to think of another one now. Drop into the chat panel something that you think, from a natural perspective, not man-made, from a natural perspective, could affect the accuracy of your compass other than geomagnetic fields because we've already mentioned that right so something natural that could affect the accuracy of your compass drop it into the chat panel let's see who's there let's see who's fastest on the draw now you see Dave if you'd not stolen your own thunder a few minutes ago you could have jumped in with that one couldn't you something natural that could affect the compass user error I would put that under man-made and, and, and don't forget User error is very definitely at my sleeve of something to talk about in a second, but user error is not, it, it's a man-made problem. It's not nature's problem causing that. It's, it's, it's idiots like us that do that. Ah, Jim, there we go. Dave and Jim have, have sort of immediately come in with, with the, the actual ground around them. Uh, yes, you're right. That's, that's the one that immediately springs to my mind. Things like the, the, the ferrous metals or the metals or the, 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 the ground type from a from a geological perspective in the ground around you. I do know that there are certain parts of the UK, I think it's the southwest, I wanna say it's copper because of the mines that used to be there, that can have a, a not insignificant effect on magnetic compasses in that part of the country. So that's that's not man-made, that's, that's just naturally occurring. So there's something there that could affect it. Iron mines, iron ore, ferrous metals in the earth, yes, spot, and that's what I was looking for. So relatively, I mean, we could we could wax lyrical about the different types of metals and make a big long list. But yeah, it, it's broad concept, that type of thing. Okay, back over to you folks again. This should be a longer list now, perhaps more varied. What about man-made issues that could affect the accuracy of your compass? Man-made things, things that we've created the problem, not Mother Nature. Let's have a look in the chat pan. Let's see what comes in the chat pan. Meanwhile, I'm gonna pay old Rosie another visit. Paul's saying your watch. Would there be anything on an OS map that might give suggest, that might give suggested interference? Um, there wouldn't be anything on an OS map that would say this could affect your compass. There's no sort of warning like that that says compass affected area or this area. But if you know what affects your compass, like we're doing now, there are some things on the Ordnance Survey map that you could look at and think, ah, that's a thing. I know that that's going to affect my compass. So there's no overt warnings like there is in a, in, in a, in a firing range or a range danger area. But if you know what affects it, you can take that from the map and, and add two and two together. Here we go. Look at this. It's flooding in, flooding in. 
pylons, yes, electricity pylons um, can, have a, uh, can have a big effect. Fences, yes. Vehicles, yes. <laughs> ah, you're in the cab, are you, Dave? You now, you see, if you went back to using horses, mate, you wouldn't have this problem. Wouldn't have this problem, would you? Um, so, yes, big, big armoured vehicles tend to have a, more than their fair share of metal on them and wiring and electricity running through them. So, yes, that can affect it. TV would affect it, speakers, yeah, yeah, things that have got electrical, ele electricity currents, electrical currents. Crikey, I'm tongue tied, I know, I'll have another mouthful of cider, that'll help. Yes, electrical currents. So, metal, electrical currents, that can cause a problem. Somebody mentioned a watch not that long ago. Yes, a watch, depending on the type of watch, could, could affect it as well. So, Metal fences, metal posts, vehicles, electricity pylons that you can see and possibly electrical currents that you can't see perhaps under your feet could affect it as well. A common one, one that is incredibly man-made, it's possibly the most up-to-date effect on your compass and something that I bet we all carry with us is your phone. Let me show you a little something here. I'm going to hold the compass at a slight angle just so that you can see that magnetic needle there. It's not, this isn't a perfect example, it should really be laid flat. But if I move the compass towards it, that, sorry, my phone towards it. You notice how that's been affected? I'll try that again. Very difficult to do because if I angle the compass too much. Try it the other way around so I can actually see it. Make sure my phone's turned on. Ah, it, it performs perfectly when the compass is absolutely flat. Unfortunately, you can't see it when it's absolutely flat. But do me a favour, if you've got a compass, if you've got a phone, if, then, then try that after this live stream. Hold your compass nice and flat. Bring your phone to it, just watch that needle deviate, and yet we all carry this and this, and I bet some of us potentially carry them in the same pocket or the same bag or something like that. So it can have an effect as well. Another compass, of course, can have an effect. That's 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 going back to school, is it? Put two compasses together and see what happens. So your phone is a really, really big modern day man-made factor in affecting your compass as well. See what people are saying. Sam so saying phones can turn magnets. Would carrying more than one compass affect either? Yes, it, yes, it would, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another example. Let me show you here. It's going to be very difficult to do because I can't, I can't hold them flat like I really should. But if I, there we go. That's possibly a better example than the phone. If I bring the two together, watch the needles. You'll notice those needles being pulled out. So yes, carry. Carrying two collectively isn't necessarily a problem. Carrying them together in the same bag is, but if you had one in your pocket for using and perhaps a spare one in your pack at the back, that's going to be okay, all right? It's, we're not saying you can, you know, they've got to be meters and meters apart, but carrying them in close proximity like I just did there, that would be a no no. Good question. I'm going to, the honest answer is that I don't know. My gut feeling would be um, yes. But, be, but I'm not basing that upon any, any scientific reason for saying it, only that I know that um, TV and radio transmitters can have an effect. And that's what was in my head earlier on when someone asked, is there anything on the map that would give you a warning? No, there's nothing over on the map. But what is on the map, or on survey maps, are electricity pylons. What is on the map are, um, are, are, are TV and radio masts. They're marked on the map, so you know if you're going if you're going to be in the area of those, and you know that they can affect your compass, you can be mindful of it. But there's no overt warning to say you are in a compass affected area or anything like that. It's about knowing up here what can affect them and being able to recognise it on the map. Jim's saying they do, Andrew. So thank you for weighing in there, Jim. My, my gut feeling was they would, but I, I didn't know for, for definite. So thank you. And waste ILO one saying it's a very noticeable effect as well. So there's another good example yet. Uh, TV, 
mobile phone transmitters having an effect as well. That's um, my mum's under my, my dad's um, login has just posted, uh, posted a couple of emojis. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, thanks mum. Thank you. It's good to see. Good to see you. Uh, you've joined us the last couple of weeks. It's good to see you've figured out how to actually contribute a message. That's it. Right, fellas? My mum's my mum's on the live stream now. I've immediately lost whatever street cred I thought I had up here has gone. And I also need to watch my language as well. Although I possibly haven't for the past two weeks. So sorry, mum. Thanks for joining in. Um, I want to show you a little hack that I do to my compass. Now, I know when you, when people hear the word hack... There's often an assumption that you're, 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 you're fiddling around with something, that you're trying to stop it working the way it was designed to work. And with something like a compass, it is quite delicate and, and also um, quite important. I want to stress this isn't about your kind of traditional hacking of something. This is a, this is a light touch hack. But let me tell you a story about why I'm sharing this uh, and then I'll share the hack with you. A lifetime ago, and about seven knee operations ago, I went. Um, I went on a course. I went on a selection course in the British Army. I was unsuccessful, but uh, it involved me running around over long distances with a lot of equipment on my back, on my own, with a map and compass, navigating from checkpoint to checkpoint to checkpoint. Those are the first kind of month or so of the course. Three, four weeks of the course involved that. I remember getting to one checkpoint been given the grid reference of the next checkpoint that I had to go to and I moved off to one side and I went through all of the route planning considerations you know I, I confirmed where I was I confirmed where I was going I confirmed the grid bearing I confirmed the magnetic bearing by converting it I looked at the distance I worked out timings I applied any corrections I needed I looked at the route blah de blah de blah all of that route planning stuff and off I went like a rat up a drain pipe off I went and I did that for several days into several weeks. And uh, at one point I headed off and the ground stopped looking like what it should have done. The map stopped being as, as close to the ground and the ground stopped being related to the map. In other words, dare I say it, I was a little bit lost or geographically embarrassed. And I couldn't figure out why, because I'd been following this process for tens, if not hundreds of miles over the previous weeks. And it had always worked, but on this occasion it wasn't. And I sort of went a little further. No joy. Went a little further, still no joy. So in the end, I took the decision to kind of backtrack to the last place I knew where I was. And I sat down and I tried to figure out what had gone wrong. Looked at all of my calculations that they were correct. Double checked everything. All of my, my addings up. It was all correct. Looked at my compass. Yeah, it still sit on the set. Oh, hang on a minute. No, it wasn't. The compass bezel here, the thing that I'm twisting, for those people that don't know, that, that thing there, there's an element of friction. Actually, there's not an element of friction to that. That's the problem. This one is quite hard to twist. You kind of need to grip it and you need to apply a bit of pressure. You need to twist it. That's a good thing. It's good that there's some friction there. That means I can, I can run around and shake this around and that isn't going to twist or slip it's going to stay locked in this one however this is decades old there's the, it just it just twists around it just slips around and that's what had happened I had applied all of the correct measurements calculations bearing to my compass etc I had set off on the right bearing and as I was running along and it was moving around in my po my jacket my, my smock pocket it twisted ever so slightly can't remember what it was off to this day, but it was enough that instead of going in that direction, I was going in that direction. And that doesn't look a great deal that difference, does it? And over a few meters, it's not. But over kilometers and kilometers, that gap gets bigger and bigger. I was way off. So from that point on, what I always do, and what I always advise people to do is get, either get a new compass, but I'm a Yorkshireman, so I'm not, you know, I'm not spending money willy nilly. Get yourself an elastic band like that, short, stubby, stumpy, strong elastic band. Stretch it over the compass like that. And it holds that compass bezel nice and tight. 
I even do that to compasses that are fairly new and don't have a problem with the bezel swivelling. Then they are they're nice and tight. I still put a, a rubber band around them just in case. One's bitten twice shy and all that. Unfortunately, that, that bite cost me dearly in the big scheme of things, that mistake, but you live and learn. So if you are using a base plate compass, even if your bezel is fairly tight, I don't think it does any harm in putting a compass, an elastic band around it just to give you that extra little piece of security. That's my hack. Hopefully you now understand it. I'm not talking about draining the liquid or doing anything crazy like that with your compass. It's just an addition that you can make to make it um, more robust and more reliable. Let's have a look what people think about that. Oh, what's A up? What's Jim trying to do here? I've done a video showing this. The swing off by about 45 degrees. Jim, you're trying to poach viewers. Yeah, Waist ILO 1, a ranger band, a cut up piece of inner tube would, would perform exactly the same purpose. Yeah, they're just some old rubber bands, some uh, parachuting equipment where we used to sort of have to tie lots of loose straps up and put big thick bands on. I've got I've got handfuls of the damn stuff still. So yes, but any, anything like that would do. Ranger bands, elastic bands, something like that would all work. Um, Dave and Jim have, have brought up a good idea here. Actually, if, if you are a YouTube channel, um, drop if it'll let you, I don't know if it'll let you, but if you are a YouTube channel, drop your link into the chat here. There's, there's no problem with that. This is about sort of building up a network and getting people to learn from each other. It's not, it's, it's not just about me. Um, so if you've got a YouTube channel, drop it in the link there and people can, you know, after the live stream or even after, you know, when this is when this recording gets played back, people can go and have a look at your uh, your channel as well. So, um, no, I don't mind at all, Jim, and it's a good idea, Dave. <laughs> I see the pair of you having a bicker over it. Drop, if you've got a YouTube channel and you're happy with it, drop a link into there and people can, uh, can go and take a look. So that was a little hack that I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you, Waste Isle. I'm, I'm glad you sort of thought it, it could come in useful. Anybody else? Anybody else any, ever had any faux pas, mistakes, problems, things gone wrong with a compass um, down, to, down, down to something going wrong with the compass rather than something around the compass? Let me know in the chat panel here. What would your advice look for in a compass for the beginner? Key features, what to avoid, etc. All right, Simon, so I would avoid, I'll tell you what I would avoid. I would avoid trying to navigate with a button compass, but I think you probably would have guessed that. I'd also avoid looking for prismatic compasses. One, because you'll need a second mortgage to buy one, a decent one. They're incredibly expensive. I'd love to have one. Um, I would go for something like this, a base plate compass. Now, that is made by, this is an unbranded one. Someone sent me this, a viewer sent me this because they bought it realized what it was measured in what its increments were realized they couldn't use it and sent it to me i'll come on to that in a second this is a silver one s-i-l-v-a sunto s-w-n-t-o are both very very good mix this one here is another silver one that's my that's my sort of go-to make is silver silver or sunto good company so go for a reputable brand it's very possible to get something that looks like that but it isn't that you know where I'm coming from? You know that the, there's a reason that silver and sunto compasses have been around for decades, if not longer. Um, so yeah, I would go for a brand that is reputable. The the key thing I think to perhaps look for and avoid, um, depending on on your preference, is what it's measured in. This is measured in degrees. We remember degrees from school: 360 degrees in a circle. That's the only compass I have that's measured in degrees. It's also the compass that looks like it's almost unused because it almost is. Because for debt for years, for 16 years plus, I was always taught and taught people using an, a measuring system called mills. That's in mills and that's in mills. The one that my that, that friend of mine, that viewer bought and, and realized they couldn't use was in mills. That's was sent to me recently. That's been with me forever. Both measured in mils. So if you're going to buy one, depending on on your preference, I'm going to I'm going to assume that you are uh, a civilian. That I would go for degrees. Go for degrees. Every, every, 
everybody can kind of conceptually wrap their head around degrees, you know, 0, 90, 180, 270, that's how out of practice how many degrees, and 360 again, so I would go for that, go for something that perhaps has a magnifying glass on it, that big, you can just see the magnifying glass, go for something like that, go for something that has Romas, you may notice in this corner of the screen here, of the compass here, you've got these two lines that intersect, it's kind of half of a square, get something like that to help you take grid references and so on, but Essentially, if you look for a Sint, Sunto or Silver compass, anything beyond an orienteering compass, you're going to be in good hands. The, the, you know, it's their core business. You're going to be in good hands. So that's what I would, I would suggest to look for. And of course, bear in mind, geomagnetic fields, what area of the Earth are you likely to be operating in? Go for a compass that's balanced for that. Or pay the extra and go for a globally balanced compass. I'm not sure both manufacturers do them, but I'm pretty certain Silver do. What have we got else going on in the chat? Ah, uh, here we go. Dave's talking about an air bubble. So I was going to get onto these things. Air bubbles in compasses are not necessarily the end of the world. Depending on the size of it, it could affect that rotation of the needle like I talked about earlier on. Think about it. You know, you've got an air bubble in what should be a vacuum of liquid or a container of liquid. Anything trying to move freely in that liquid hits the air bubble, it could impact it. They're not the end of the world. They tend to be caused by either physical damage to the compass, which is a problem. Air's getting in, therefore liquid's getting out. That's a problem. They can also come about just by changes in air temperature or altitude, quick changes in air temperature and altitude. So if you were to, um, if you were to take your compass from the, from the garden shed, and bring it into the house or vice versa you could well see a bubble fall if you place it on a warm radiator and monitor it you'll probably find that that bubble will disappear if it disappears and doesn't come back it was probably some sort of atmospheric change that did it if it stays and gets bigger and bigger then you notice a puddle on the floor under your radiator either your radiator's got a leak or probably your compass has got a leak and at that point it's it's sort of index for the compass bin it and get yourself a new one but but air bubbles can be a problem um, but they needn't need they needn't be the end of the world they needn't mean that you have to have a new compass you can kind of deal with them by by applying some heat through a radiator good point thank you for raising it dave said mills all the way can't get on with the degrees for the same reason as you plus mills are more accurate <laughs> yes dave yeah yeah it's a it's a bloody hard habit to break out of and i have desperately tried i've really tried but um, yeah, it, it mills all the way. For anybody who's thinking, why is it more accurate? What, what, what's Craig and Dave? What's this in joke here? Think about a cake. Think about a round cake. Think about cutting that up into degrees, 360 degrees. There will be 360 slices of cake, right? That seems quite small. Imagine a normal sized birthday cut, cutting that up into 360 slices. They'd be really thin slices, right? They'd be quite accurate slices and you'd be right until you think about taking that same cake and cutting it up into drum roll please 6400 slices 360 degrees in a circle 6400 mils in a circle those slices of cake that you thought were very fine before i've just cut a damn sight finer. That's why the military and possibly other sectors as well tend to use mills because it's far more accurate than degrees. But I'll be really, really honest here. Plenty of people have survived for plenty of years around the world doing far more adventurous things than I've ever done just using degrees. So let's not pretend that it's, it's you know, if you're using degrees, you're going to get lost you might still get lost but equally you can get just as lost using mills as well it's um don't let mills versus degrees worry you if you don't need to use mills use degrees you'll find far more teaching resources and references about degrees than you will about mills if you ever go on any courses unless you're in the military they will teach you in degrees so don't worry about it but i agree dave it's a bloody hard habit to break 
Thank you, TM. So he mentioned the Sunto A30. He's got a big magnifying glass. Brilliant for replacing your reading glasses in the rain. Thank you, Tony from Dublin. What are the pros, cons of mills? I probably just mentioned that, Simon. Um, pros, incredibly accurate. Um, doesn't mean to say you can't get lost. Um, cons. If you know mills, so if you know degrees, you'll need to unlearn them and learn mills. This is the opposite problem to what I've got. Also, there's just not as much material and teaching resources around, around mills as there are degrees. So if, you, if you're not in the military, I, I wouldn't go for mills, to be perfectly honest. You're probably setting yourself up for a, for a harder slog learning to navigate than if you go with mil degrees. If you've got good skills and you're lucky, you, you're not, you know, you'll be okay with degrees. Are there any exercises you would recommend with, with making root cards of different waypoints and bearings that are planned from home, but then you go out on the field and see if they put you on target? Thank you, Dave. Do you know what? As, as I was talking earlier on about slices of cake and, and one degree is accurate, but one mil is even more accurate, I was trying to think what the what the ratio is. And you're right, it's 17.7 mils in a degree. So for every, every one degree, which is bloody fine, there's 17.7 mils inside that degree. Gives you an idea about just how granular it can be. Thank you, Dave, for, for, for weighing in with that. Um, Brian Esquire, any exercises you'd recommend with making root cards? Yes. I mean, there's no specific one. I wouldn't say go and do this, but anything that you can do at home with, with sitting down on Friday evening with a, <laughs> maybe not with a bottle of Old Rosie, to be honest, if you don't want to get lost. Getting your map out. Plotting a route, possibly on some open area rather than around your housing estate and stuff. People might have a problem with you walking through their garden with the excuse of a marching on a bearing. Open area, local park, local wildlife park, something like that. And just plotting some obvious points. Don't make life difficult. Don't say, I want to go for this contour line or I want to go for this wiggle in the lake or the street. Go for obvious points, plotting it out. Working out the grid bearing from one to the other. Looking at your grid magnetic angle. Applying, if you need to, to make it a magnetic bearing. Then going out and marching on that. Did marching from the car park office to the, the bridge over the stream. Did that bearing take you directly to the bridge or did it take you slightly off? So anything that you can do to help practice the taking of grid bearings the application of gma to make the magnetic bearings the marching on those magnetic bearings you know the theory is half the battle moving on it is another battle anything you can do brian is is, is good stuff that that's navigating that's micro now that's that's that that's learning to map read and navigate so yes any of any stuff like that anything you've got in mind like that as long as you're kind of doing it safely, especially if you're a newcomer, especially if you're at a low level and, you know, if, if you slightly go, if you go slightly off, you're just not going to hit the bridge over the stream. You, you know, if you go slightly off, you're just not going to hit the cafe. You're going to hit a, a track as opposed to if you go slightly off, you're going over the edge of a cliff. You know, there's a difference here. So as long as you're doing it safely, then, um, then you yeah, knock yourself out with those types of exercises. That's that's where the learning is watching me prattle on, on a live stream watching youtube videos reading books all helps but the learning is in the wobbles getting out there and doing it uh, thank you dave thank you you could read my mind ian sending i uh, hope i put the chat up there it got stuck in a meeting ian i'm not sure if the chat goes up alongside the, the recording afterwards um if I try and edit the recording afterwards, I know it doesn't, it strips it out, but I'm not editing the recording, much to people's annoyance possibly. So I, I don't know, let's let's find out tomorrow morning when this, when this gets published. Sam has been sailing for years and has always been in degrees, never heard of mills, surprised it was never used on the sea for covering such vast distances. Yes, yeah. the industries that I often think I'm surprised they don't work in mills is 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 maritime, is sailing, and uh, and also in the military as well, which is why I think the army has to operate in degrees and mills because the army operates. If I get this right, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. You're you're clearly more up to date than me. 
the army operates in mils for accuracy with artillery. You kind of want that to be accurate, right? Um, but the RAF operate in degrees, so the army kind of needs to operate in both, I think. Oh yeah, Ian, yeah, the recording will be going up here. Yes, absolutely. All of the all of these are recorded live anyway. They render overnight and tomorrow morning they'll be published so you can catch up with the, the, the point to where you were you were unable to make it. And I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wonder, is the reason that the maritime and sailing is locked into degrees because, I mean, I'm no historian, but my gut feeling tells me, common sense tells me, people were sailing around the world way before anybody thought about mills as a concept. And therefore, degrees and sun degrees and sun compasses and sextants and, and that sort of stuff. I kind of don't quite know what I'm talking about here. I've just seen it in movies. Um what just became part of the maritime and 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 and, and um, sailing culture and, and 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 practices it was only later that mills came along but it was already embedded in the maritime world. so i suspect it might be an, an offset i would imagine if everybody was starting afresh now and mills was a thing everyone might go for mills because it is more accurate but um degrees up is possibly just more is, is a longer stay it's longer standing concept so what i'm looking for Thanks for conveying that, Dave. Dave, yeah, Dave brings up a bloody valid point. Um, nautical nav using degrees through with lat and long, lat latitude and longitude are, are in, you know, lines of latitude and longitude are in degrees, minutes, and seconds. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in a degree. Um, so yes, so, so the, the, the concept of lat and long for sailing, again, all bearing back to the fact that we were probably navigating around the world, needing to navigate around the world accurately by sea, possibly predates our ability to wanting to throw artillery shells at other people, um, by quite, a, possibly by quite a long way. Several generations, I should think at least. So there's one final thing, I, I'm still going to answer questions, feel, feel free to keep dropping them there. There's one thing here that somebody mentioned right at the beginning of the challenge I set you all about. Tell me something that's, that is natural that could affect your compass. Uh, and someone else has also mentioned it more recently. Apologies, I can't remember who the two people were. But this and this and this not so much that let's put that to one side but you know your, your standard traditional kind of base plate compasses your prismatic compasses things like that they're accurate pieces of kit they're good pieces of kit if you look after them if you take care of them if you are aware of their limitations in terms of the environment around you natural or man-made they will stand you in good stead but they are a tool they are an instrument you can have the sharpest scalpel in the hospital, but if an idiot is waving it around, things are going to go wrong. You can have the smartest computer program in the world, but if you've got me clunking away on the keyboard inputting information, there's a good chance it's going to go wrong. And that's the point with the compass. Brilliant pieces of kit, but garbage in, garbage out. You pour crap information into that. You get your grid bearing wrong and everything after that is going to be wrong. If you get your grid bearing right but apply your GMA incorrectly, your magnetic bearing is going to be wrong. If you get your grid bearing right and you apply your GMA correctly but you set it incorrectly on the compass, it's going to be wrong. If you do all of that correct and you take your bearing and you look at a point to march on and then get distracted and wander off because something else looks more interesting, you're going to go wrong. So they're great pieces of kit. The biggest downfall of using a compass is, is us using it, right? That's, that's, that's where I've, I've never seen a compass lead itself wrong. I've never seen a compass input information into it incorrectly. I've never seen a compass do the calculations required to use it incorrectly i've seen god knows how many squaddies over the years myself included back in the day balls it up the compass is just a tool that we wield if we wield it wrong it will go wrong if we wield it correctly doesn't mean to say we won't get lost i'll stress that but we're reducing the likelihood 
of it happening. And that's the kind of final key thing I really wanted to get across today was buying an expensive compass and, and, and learning how to use it and all of that is, is great. And I'm not suggesting go and buy an expensive one. I'm trying to make a point here. But ultimately, it's, it's a dumb tool. The, 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 the responsibility is on us, it's on me and you, you and I, to know how to use it, to know its limitations and to ensure that we do everything we can to put the correct data into it or the correct data leading up to it. Otherwise, you may as well try and navigate with, I don't know, that Sharpie pen as as much chance if you're going to put crap information into it. That's the kind of final key thing that I wanted to talk about to get over to, but I'm still happy to answer any questions. I used to just use compass bearing northwest by northwest by west to quarter west would be like 289 degrees off 5137.7 mils tell me you used a calculator and you didn't just work that out on the fly i'll be very very embarrassed if you worked that out on the fly Simon. although i imagine if you're a sailor you are probably quite good at converting figures uh, relatively quickly folks that's all i wanted that's all i wanted to cover off in today's live stream and um, still happy to hang around for another minute or two in case more questions come in but that's everything i wanted to cover off so let's let's recap on this a magnetic compass points to magnetic north yes but bear in mind those geomagnetic fields not because they change the direction the compass points in as such it's still doing its job but because if you are going to go traveling if you are going to cover huge i mean massive distances you may need more than one compass or you may need a globally balanced compass. Wherever you're operating, whatever your compass is balanced for, you're on the Earth's surface. There are things on that surface that might affect the compass. There are man-made things around us that might affect the compass. There are man-made things that we might be carrying with us that might affect the compass as well. So do bear that in mind. Remember the little tip about applying the rubber band if your bezel is starting to work loose a little, or even if it's not, it's a good, it's a good safety measure. And that final point I made is possibly the most critical one because it involves us getting off our backsides and developing our skills. Garbage in, garbage out. Most expensive compass in the world in front of, in front of an idiot is going to be as much use as that marker pen in terms of navigating. So if there's any more questions coming in. Simon cheated. Well, at least you were honest, Simon. At least you were honest. Some compasses are levable, but I'm sure you're holding them flat. Modern needles can have a fair amount of tilt and still wet. Yes, they can indeed, Brian, yet. How important is it to keep the compass precisely flat? Um, it's important, Brian, to keep the compass as flat as you can. Precisely flat is, I mean, I'm picking up on the exact words you've used here. Precisely flat. It isn't that important, you know, no, nobody's carrying an instrument to ensure that that is absolutely parallel to the Earth's surface. Who's going to do that? But keeping it flat is an idea. You know, something like that, I'm, a, I'm having to adjust this because the camera is, is fine. Trying to, to, you know, hold your compass and, and take a bearing like that or like that or like that or like that, not so good. But if you were to lay it on the palm of your hand, you know, put your hand out in front of you. You've, you've got a fairly sense that that's flat, but that isn't. And that that's flat, but that isn't. Now lay it on your palm, put it on your palm. That, that's good enough for modern compasses, you know. These are designed to be used outdoors in all weathers by people who are not necessarily there to navigate. They're there to save people. They're there to rescue people. They're there to undertake operations. They're there for all sorts of... They're not out there navigating necessarily for the fun of it so that you know they're, they're relatively what i used to call squaddy proof you know they're, they're fairly robust pieces of kit um but no they don't have to be precisely flat um, in my opinion you're very welcome here no worries at all um did we go over how to tell if it was broken up we talked about bubbles in it we talked about how it was affected eddy by um, external points and external things um we didn't talk about if it was broken i mean if there's I guess the easiest way to tell if a compass is broken is, is to do sort of a sense check. I know when I stand at this point in my office that that, you can't see, there's a telegraph pole there, that is magnetic north from this point here. If I was to take a compass out and it wasn't pointing there, 
I'd make sure that nothing around it is affecting it, but and I could tell it was broken. So having a sense check about what direction it's pointing is a, is a useful check to see if there's any non-obvious damage. But if something's cracked, if it's leaking, if it's got a massive air bubble, um, are fairly obvious things. The great thing about a compass is um, it, it's relative, if you know what to look for, and you're aware that a compass can get broken and be affected, it's relatively easy to know that, that it has been. If you're not aware, if you think compass is infallible and will always point in the direction you want it to, that's when you can get caught out. Good question. You're very welcome. Yeah, fair points, Tony. I've never had to navigate in waves, <laughs> thankfully. Strong winds, yes, but never waves, never going up and down and side to side. Good point. Same time next week, Jim. Uh, I think so. I, I'd like to tell you what next week's session is going to be about, like I did last week. But I'll be honest, I haven't thought that far ahead. I've had a busy week uh, with, with house um, conveyancing and house moves and solicitors and things like that. But yeah, if you guys want one next week, let me know in the chat panel and I will throw something in um, next week. I'll, you know, I'll take either compasses on a stage further or I'll take mats on a stage further. But we'll do something next week that doesn't necessarily need lots of hands on but could be useful to you when you go away. If I could ask a final favour of you, if you all wouldn't mind, if you're not yet a subscriber, could you hit that subscribe button if you wouldn't mind, if you'd like to see more from my channel. And if you are, thank you for already being one, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button on this video on your way out, that will help obviously to the algorithm to, to get a sense about, to share this with other people. But anything you can do to get this video, to get this live stream, or indeed my channel, a further, you know, f further expanse would be really appreciated. But no pressure, no pressure. Enjoy your weekend, whatever you're doing, whatever you're up to. I'm going to go and finish off. I'm going to go and finish off old Rosie. I mean, there's no part of that sentence that doesn't sound weird, is there? But I am. I'm going to go and finish off old Rosie now. I hope you have a great weekend. Stay safe. Enjoy the outdoors. Get outdoors. Stay safe. And I will see you uh, this time next week. Thanks for watching, folks. Take care.